Uh, good morning, uh, sisters and brothers. Uh, it's good to, uh, to be here. Um, I was out at QP convention yesterday, uh, which also made this uh, even better, because um, had I been there, I had to make two trips, and I only have to make one trip. <laughs> I do have to say it's an honor to, to be with you here today at uh, your important convention. I know there's going to be many discussions and debates about how you're going to grow this organization, how are you going to build it, and more importantly, um, how are you going to try and, of course, uh, re-energize the activism that is needed. If I can give you one piece of advice, there's no magic. It's called hard work. Roll up your sleeve, and you move one foot after the other and just keep doing it, and we'll make a hell of a difference. We can't do it any other way. There'll be a lot of things we need to learn, and you'll talk about that, but more importantly, it requires, of course, as I did when I was a young, uh, trade union activists. Once in a while, you got to act up too, by the way. You have to make David Jobs a little bit more interesting. Because <laughs> without, without some agitation, there is no change. And it's fundamental to understand that our movement doesn't grow and doesn't evolve if we don't try to act up once in a while. And yeah, people like me may not like it, but it's not that bad, actually. It helps the movement get strengthy. So it's a delight to be here. I want to thank David and your executive. And all of you, of course, for inviting me to be here. And more importantly, I'm delighted to be here to share some time to you. It's also about a month uh, since we had a federal election. It seems like yesterday, but it's been a month. My God, I can't tell you to see how pleased I was to see the backside of Stephen Harper. <laughs> After 10 years of torturous uh, journey throughout this country, it's unimaginable to believe what we accomplished. And every one of you, I think, in this room who worked hard and dedicated your time and your effort, need to feel good. Because the last 10 years have not been a good place for this country. We have truly been challenged, and I think it shows the conviction and the energy of our movement when we put our hands together and say we're going to do something, we actually get it done. Because I do believe the defeat of Stephen Harper give us a chance now as a movement to talk about how we can make progress again in this country. Because the last 10 years has not been nothing about progress. It's been about the things that we spent decades building in this country, watching them disappear in a systematic way where a prime minister with his ideological conviction thought he can redraw the map of this country and change how we evolved to become a great nation in the world. We, of course, have an opportunity ahead of us, and more importantly, to take this opportunity and to figure out how we can ensure we can rebuild and, more importantly, grow and develop this country in a way that reflect what our values are in this country. You know, the attack over the last 10 years, what has been on health care, which was supposed to kick in uh, starting in 2016, some $36 billion of cuts is not going to happen, and we've got to ensure that doesn't happen. The attack on EI workers who lose their jobs to this country who can't access benefit has just been a scandal. The EI account became another slush fund for the government to use to give tax cut to their rich friends. Two billion dollars of the EI account was taken out just before the election. Only for one purpose only, is to allow the rich and the wealthy in this country to access, of course, income splitting. Where only 20% of the richest people in this country would benefit and 80% get none. At the same time, and just one example, where only 20% of the unemployed in the city of Toronto receive benefits. 80% gets nothing despite losing their jobs and paying into this account. This Prime Minister went, of course, to Davos, Switzerland to tell us we have to work two more years to get our OAS and GIS. Of course, the attack on women's organization across this country in the last 10 years has been devastating. Every women's organization has been defunded except for the ones that agree with their ideological and convic conviction. First Nation people have never seen a war waged against their interests by this government in the last 10 years. And of course, the environmental movement will label, of course, as terrorists because they take money from other places to do their work. Our labor movement, it's amazing we're still standing on our strong, determined uh, conviction that we were going to fight. And you know, if the conservative learned one thing, is that when you pick a fight with us, until you're defeated, you will not stop. Christy Clark will learn that here too. It's only a question of time.
Your fight back made a difference, my friends. Um, since my election in the Congress uh, last year in 2014, I spent 15 months on the ground traveling this country. And people said, don't you have something better to do with your time? I said, yes, traveling the country to talk to activists and leadership. Because what you need to know is your new president of Congress, I'm determined. We are going to revitalize the activists in this movement. We're going to mobilize and engage because the things that we want and we desire for ourselves, we're going to fight to make sure it happens, not just talk about it. Because if we do it, we'll win. And we are, of course, going to change the tide. You need to know as you're going to deliberate in many different challenges that you're going to be looking at and face with, we're in a good place. We are still one of the bright lights of the labor movement throughout the world. I get to travel on your behalf uh, quite often around the world to talk to my colleagues. I know you may not see it this way, but I want you to appreciate. Early this year, the Supreme Court made two very important rulings, but they were significant. They're the most significant in our evolution as a labor movement in the courts in this country. The court ruled that the right to organize and freedom of association is a fundamental right protected by our Constitution. And that only happened because the labor movement took its case to the Supreme Court and made a clear, concise argument to the courts and the courts sided with us. No government can take away that right now because it's enshrined in our Constitution in this country. We won the right to collective bargaining and the right to go on, strike, uh, go on strike is now enshrined in our Constitution again because we took our case to the Supreme Court. What you don't understand and appreciate, these don't, things don't happen in isolation. The dues that you pay, part of our arsenal of things we used in the fight is we have to use the court and use it smart and effectively. Yes, we need to go there, but we also, it's a two-edged sword. It can be in your favor, it could be against you. We have a legal committee in the Congress. It's set up specifically to ensure if we're going to take a case to the Supreme Court in this country, we better ensure the lawyers are going there so they're not simply representing their interests, they're representing our interests. And we need to be concise. Yeah, they're all smart people, but we don't need 50 lawyers making the same points. And what we did was am amazing because what our legal counsel will tell us now is the best thing we ever done because we had to discipline them about the role they play on our behalf. As a result of that, we won these victories. I can tell you these had monumental consequence, not just here in our country, but at the international level. At the ILO, they were deliberating about whether or not the right to strike was real and it's enshrined in ILO conventions. The minute our victory came down in the Supreme Court, the debate ended at the ILO. It ended, simply ended, they said, well, we're not going to challenge that anymore because they had some right-wing asshole lawyer from Canada representing the employers <laughs> making the argument the right to strike is not a fundamental right, it didn't be protected. It's kind of dumb to you to go now to ILO to argue when the Supreme Court of Canada just confirmed this right. And I want you to say, sisters and brothers, we have to take advantage of that right because without the right to strike in our country, the employers can always, always defeat us. It's the only tool we have we use it effectively and we use it judiciously and when we do it properly, we will win on behalf of our members in this country. <laughs> so I'm feeling good as to where we're at. We got a lot of hard work ahead of us now because we're finally able to turn the page after 10 years of attack on working people. Of course, the Stephen Harper government in the last, uh, since 2000, the last four years when they got a majority, they've used every opportunity to intervene in the legislature to take away the rights of workers to bargain. Even before they've exercised the right to go on strike, the government already had legislation drafted. And some of the most draconian legislation we've ever seen in the history of our country, where they legislate workers back to work and impose, of course, final offer selection, where only the employers win in those situations. I cannot begin to tell you, sisters and brothers, what we achieved on October the 19th. We had set out as a Congress, of course, very clear. Our fundamental objective in this upcoming, that, the most previous election, was to defeat Stephen Harper. It took a coordinated effort with a clear message, but we also had to stake out what we want to see happen with the future government. Yes, it is disappointing to see so many of our good friends in the NDP who lost their seats and did not get elected on October the 19th. My own MP, Peggy Nash, in my own writing, lost her seat on, on, on October the 19th. Peggy was a tremendous trade unionist, 
and a great sister. And she's not going to be in the House of Commons. But we also won some victories on October the 19th. We elect some. By the way, you did an amazing job in British Columbia. I want to thank all of you for the hard work you did because it made a hell of a difference. Despite the decisions been made in the East, by the time it got here, you said, thank you very much. We're going to make our own in BC. I want to thank you for your conviction and the hard work you did out here. Maybe there is some purpose to that Moncton after all. <laughs> This election for the Congress was to ensure we put 100%, not anything less. And I can tell you, the work we did in the Congress, I'm so proud. We had more unity in our affiliates in any time in the history in the Congress. Everybody understand we had one objective, was to defeat Stephen Harper and to work and to elect as many new Democrats as we could. Our movement didn't fracture itself. We did not divide ourselves. We said to people we had to focus and we had to be disciplined. Yes, it required work, and quite often, you know, labor leaders are like herding cats. They're wonderful people, but all of them got some opinion on their own, and they think they got the solution. I have to listen to this all the time. There's 53 leaders that tell me every day what I'm supposed to do, and I says, thank you very much, but here's what we're going to do. <laughs> There's democracy. <laughs> Once in a while, if you're going to lead, you have to lead from the front, not from the back of the room, by the way. And once in a while, my colleagues, as wonderful as they are, I enjoy their, their determination, but I have to remind them, we're one movement. And we have one objective, to represent the best interests of working people in this country. And that means sometimes we've got to put aside our bullshit and pull together as one. And it does work. <laughs> so what does this opportunity offer us, my friends? You know, it's quite amazing things, and I want to share this with you because we see it from different places. On the morning of the 20th, I got up. I was in Montreal. I looked out of my hotel room. The sun was up. I looked over, and I thought, what a great day it is. Such a relief. Because had we not won, the first thing I had to contemplate is the war we would have for the next four years. Because these guys were determined. They were coming back with a vengeance. Harper understood very clearly that if he got stopped, he would be stopped by the labor movement in this country. With the only institution that had 3.3 million, there's 4 million workers in this country that belong to unions. He understood we were going to do everything we can. He knew we were out there mobilizing. He knew we were out there agitating in communities after communities. I did over 40 canvases for NDP candidates across the country and dragged labor leaders at the national level to come out and join me. Because I said, it's good to ask activists to go out and do this work, but you have to lead by example, show up and do the same thing you're asking them to do. So we tell them we are determined because we're going to win this fight. And it made all the difference because the activists, yeah, not all the campaigns were going to win, but what they need to do, their efforts is not in vain. And on the 20th morning when I got up, I thought we did our job. Harper's finally gone. Now we can talk about where we go in building a movement because the war we would have to fight had we not defeated him. How do we keep this movement together? Look across the border to our American friends and understand how they got there. We can never let, allow that to happen in our country. In uh, Ontario, the same thing happened. We had a guy campaigning, his name was Tim Hunak. He was going to take away the right to collect your dues, saying it's going to bring right to work legislation in Canada. He didn't give a damn what he says. Then he said he was going to fire 100,000 public sector workers. And I said, not under my watch. I came out to the CLC convention. I said to the affiliates and the Federation of Labor, we will do whatever is necessary. Because the minute they plant that flag anywhere in this country, in right to work laws, it will be the demise of our movement. Everywhere in the United States where they plant the flag, watch the density of union disappeared. We cannot allow that to happen in our country. And you know, fundamentally, sisters and brothers, we did our job very well. We did mobilize our members. But now we have an opportunity, of course, to say to the new government, because we're not a political party, we're a trade union organization. How do we work with them? How do we hold them account for the things that they made as promises to Canadians and get them to do it? And let me go through some of the things that the new government talked about. They're going to work, of course, to negotiate a new health care record to restore the funding with the provinces because $36 billion of cut would start next year. Think of the devastation that would bring to our national health care system. They've committed money, of course, to, to deal with 
semblance of starting a national pharmacare program. For decades we've been arguing. There's three million Canadians who get a prescription every day in this country and they can't get it filled. You know why? Because they make the decision, do I pay the rent, do I buy food, or do I buy medication? This is unacceptable. In a rich country as ours, people are making the decision whether or not they're going to buy food or pay the rent or buy a prescription. If you're sick, you need to get well to go back to work. And we should have a national pharmacare so no worker should have to make those choices in our country. <laughs> 800,000 people are waiting right now for home care in this country. It should be brought into the healthcare system. Because by the way, whether you like it or not, we're going to have an extremely aging population. It's going to increase every single day. And if we don't make home care part of the healthcare system, is working families are going to struggle. I've got a 92-year-old mother. I know for a fact she will be in home care eventually. Without my support, she'd be living in object poverty. So I think we have to hold the government that says, you know, I don't have to refund health care, but more importantly, you've got to expand it and grow it because it's the reality of a modern health care system. The new government made a commitment about infrastructure. Right here, by the way, you had a plebiscite about whether or not you're going to pay more taxes. By the way, there is no free ride and there's no free run lunch. We have to pay for it. It simply was unacceptable that Christy Carr government didn't show courage and leadership. Because if public infrastructure is needed, by God, we should tell the people the truth and says you're going to have to pay for it and it's going to come out of your tax dollars. You don't have to have a plebiscite to decide whether or not you're going to pay for it. Yes, we have to fund it because if we don't fund it, we clog our street with cars that goes nowhere. People spend hours on end going nowhere when we should be expanding public transit. Now, with the federal government funding, we need to talk about how we rebuild our infrastructure in this country, because it's aging. It will create all kinds of jobs. But we also have to insist there's some social justice to the infrastructure. How do we give marginalized communities an opportunity to get apprenticeship and say, if you're going to spend taxpayer dollars, you tell those contractors they have to hire apprentice and give young people a chance to get a future. Because it's taxpayers' money you're using, by God, we can do something to help apprenticeship in this country and give Aboriginal communities and marginalized communities a chance to have some decency in going to work. And that's what we need to do in pushing the infrastructure program that is coming. This government has also made a decision. We have campaigned now for over six years to expand the Canada Pension Plan. Over six years. Because as I'm speaking to you today, 11 million workers going to work, 11 million that have no pension. 11 million. You belong to a union, likely you have a pension plan. When they retire, that 11 million people, if we don't do something, so we have to work with this government, the provincial government, to reach a consensus to say we must, of course, expand CPP. It's the most efficient way of doing it. It's the cheapest cost way of doing it. And more importantly, it's the right thing to do. They're going to roll back OAS and GIS back to 65. For every year they roll it back, it'll put $12,000 in the pockets of working people in this country. By the way, the rich don't get OAS and GIS. It is working people who gets it. And Harper was very clear when he made the change. It's going to again take billions, billions of dollars out to the system so you can fund tax to the rich. And it's the right thing to do. We've got to make sure this new government keeps its responsibility because that's about you and me and our families and our friends and our neighbor who are going to depend on the OAS and GIS in this country. They've also made a commitment to expand, added uh, to fund GIS, increased by 10%. We have seniors' poverty in this country because we don't give them enough when they retire. If you spend a lifetime in this country and working, you should not have to live in poverty. It should be a fundamental principle of our nation. Not because you belong to a union. Nobody should spend a lifetime in this country and have to retire in poverty. Our country is rich as ours. We can do better. We must do better. <laughs> By the way, three and a half years it took to Stephen Harper to finally get the three sevens through, through the Senate because of our effort. We didn't roll over and tell them, go ahead and do it. We fought them every step of the way. And the only reason they got to do it, because they rigged the rules. They finally passed. We have a commitment from the new government that they are going to ensure that 377 never see the light of the day. And as soon as I meet with the prime minister, I say, but by now in Christmas, you better repeal the law because that's what you promised. We're going to hold you account to that at the end of the day.
Bill C-525, piece of legislation, private members bill that took away car checks, something we had at a federal level for over 60 years. New government has made a commitment, they're going to restore it and we're going to hold them account. But by the way, it's also critical, and I'm going to say this to my colleagues next week when we have a Canadian Council, it's good that the government is going to restore the law the way it was for workers who wants to join a union without the interference of their employer. But I think we're going to have a serious conversation in the Congress for those affiliates who organize in the federal jurisdiction. If the law is an impediment to organizing, then tell me if we get the law restored how we're going to do organizing differently. Because I think we have to face the honest truth. I don't think we have taken advantage of the legislation when it was in place. And if we're going to get it restored, we need to have a bit of a strategy. There's thousands of workers in the federal jurisdiction that does not belong to unions. Uh, we need to utilize the new legislation will come back into place and says, how do we push as a labor movement to give workers a chance? It is a fundamental principle to get this legislation repealed. This government also promised they're going to launch a national inquiry for missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls in this country. I can't tell you how impressed I am that that's going to happen. Because for all the argument has been made, the only reason Stephen Harper didn't do it is because of the racism, outright. Is. We need to call it for what it is. Sometimes we pretend we want to be nice, you know, don't say things. That's the truth. But more importantly, this inquiry is not going to restore the lost lives. But I think what it will allow us to do as Canadians is to look very carefully how the justice system has failed First Nation people in this country. How is it that when one of us disappeared, the police will put maximum efforts to figure out and do whatever is necessary, but yet over 1,200 women and girls have disappeared and the police force failed them, the legal system's failing, the justice system failing? It speaks to the embedded racism in our system, and we have to face up to it. It's no different than the residential school issues. And this is the honest but the difficult truth about how our First Nation people fare in our own country. I hope this inquiry will mo fo force all of us to look at what's wrong with our justice system because it is not equal and we need to make it equal because no group in our society should have to go through this. And I think it's the right thing to do. We will learn much from the inquiry. This government has also made a commitment. The Prime Minister is going to take the Premiers. They're going to go to Paris for the first climate change conference. By the way, we spend an entire decade with a Prime Minister who's denier, climate denier, that climate change is not real. I want to tell you I'm deeply troubled about what's happening on our planet because the reality is if we don't turn back the clock, we are living in difficult times. By the way, the planet will still exist. I'm not sure we're going to be here. That's the honest truth. But I also think we need to see this as an opportunity, not in terms of what our commitment will be about how we reduce greenhouse gases, but how do we build a sustainable economy, a new economy that embraces the future. Yes, we will have to go to zero carbon. There's already a commitment made by the G7 countries to get to zero carbon in 80 years. I think we need to do it sooner because the reality is we can't continue the way we have been operating. But this is also an opportunity for talk about how we can create new jobs in green industries and figure out how we can take some responsibility to change the way and how we have operated. This is a major, major effort for us. I have signed the LEAP manifesto that some of my friends have produced. And people said, you're crazy. What are you doing? You're going to get yourself in shit. I said, that's fine. But you know what, sisters and brothers, you can't lead an organization by pretending that you can solve all of our people all the time. Once in a while, you have to challenge. And as your leader, I want you to know very clearly, the challenge we're facing in climate change is real, and your president have no intention of hiding behind some desk or in a corner somewhere. I'm going to be in the forefront. By signing that manifesto, I give my set of myself a seat at the table, because I'll be there to talk about the interests of working people and the trade union movement, because we need to be there. It's not simply one group of people who need to be there. It's not just environmentalists. Workers need to be consulted, they need to be engaged, and more importantly, we need to bring our solutions to the table, and I intend to be part of that discussion. <laughs> I want to touch on two more very quick things and just come to one final point. 
Prime Minister said that they're going to bring, or committed to bring some 20,000 Syrian refugees to our country. We watched this issue debating during the election. And Harper tell us, you know, we got to screen everybody. We got to do this and do that and all the reasons and the excuses he made. We've always been a generous country. We have dealt with this many times over. When groups of people have been faced with huge challenges, we find a way to do our part. Germany has already taken in one million Syrian refugees. There's four million Syrian refugees today in the, in the world. The reality is we need to do our part. Uh, we have set up a fund in the CLC to work with the Canadian Council of Refugees and its agencies across the country that's going to sponsor and resettle. But I think as the Prime Minister announced, we need to do our part. But we also need to recognize during the previous election how Stephen Harper exploited this and talked about difference. And somehow if somebody's wearing a niqab that they're a danger to our values and our country. The Prime Minister, by the way, who create an ambassadorship to, pr to promote religious freedoms everywhere outside Canada except in Canada. How such hypocrisy can exist. By the way, the whole thing about the niqab is absolutely bullshit. It's 100% racism and it needs to be called for what it is. It's simply unacceptable that a prime minister, all in the interest of winning some votes, would use something like that to divide society and create suspicion against friends and neighbors and colleagues. I'm one of those people who understand very clearly. I have a name, by the way, with that group that the prime minister would like to associate. He also pa passed Bill C-51. The bill has nothing to do with security of our nation. By the way, I'm a proud Canadian. I came to this country as an immigrant, but I love my country. I will do everything to ensure my country is safe. But more importantly, I have no intention of any prime minister or anyone criminalizing me or stigmatizing me in my own country. I'm a full citizen. By God, I'll take my rights anytime. <laughs> Justin Trudeau says they'll review the law. There's nothing to review. We need to scrap C-51. Nothing less will suffice. <laughs> so over the next little while, sisters and brothers, we've got a lot of work to do. Because if we're going to ensure this new government keep their commitment, we have to be in the forefront. Yes, we will have to visit our members of parliament to start talking to them about our priorities. And we're going to have to lobby them. But we're also going to have to continue to educate and mobilize our members. Because if I learned one thing, and I heard some of these criticism in the CLC convention, they said the lobbying stuff is really good, Hassan, but we can't just do that. I understand that. I know that. But more importantly, gains don't come if we don't get in the forefront. So I'm going to be asking you, we will certainly, I'll announce next week, we plan to have a spring lobby in Ottawa in the new year. We'll bring our activists to come up so they can go visit their member of parliament and talk to them about the issues. We'll provide the material and train them. Because this is important work. All of us have to do this, by the way, not once in a while, on a continuous basis. Now, it's nice to elect people in Parliament, but if you don't show up and in their face, you don't exist. Because when you're not there, guess what? The employers are there, the business community is there, talking to them every single day. And we have to be, it's like the collective agreement in the workplace. If you didn't have shop stored and union enforcing that collective agreement, watching the employer, they will violate it and they will get away with it. It's no different in regard to legislation that we want to see happen in this country. We have to be in politicians' face. We have to remind them. By the way, we are the people you get elected to serve. Do the right thing and serve our interests before you think of the other side. <laughs> so my friends, I know the difficulties and the challenges we all face when you're trying to build a vibrant organization. But if I could leave political action aside, I really want to commend you for your convention and, of course, the team that you choose. But you know, I happen to be when this courageous union was born in Miami, Florida, of all places. <laughs> First time in the history of Canada, by the way, where a Canadian union was founded in an American country. But I want to say I remember that day like yesterday. And I was so honored and pleased to be at your founding convention. Because what your leadership have decided, you're going to take your own destiny in your own hands. Because you thought you could do something better. You can control your future. 
And by the way, you can build a better and more vibrant union. And since that day, you have not looked back because of your courage and your conviction. As you will cross a new path today in terms of in the next couple of days in your decisions you're going to make here, see this again as another opportunity, another door that's open to give this union new life and new energy and new enthusiasm. But it's like everything else, you've got to take advantage of it. You know, activism is not something that somebody can tell you to do. You've got to wake up in the morning and feel it in your blood. This is the right thing to do. It's necessary. I got elected when I was 18 years of age because I was crazy. <laughs> I used to tell the boss to screw off. More profane language than that, by the way. <laughs> and some of my colleagues thought, why don't you run for chairman? <laughs> I thought it's kind of weird. Well, why would you guys elect me? No. Finally, they told me, they said, we prefer you get fired than us. <laughs> <laughs> I did get elected and quickly learned very quickly that when you're responsible for the lives of people, you better grow up and grow up fast. I swear a little, not as much, but I learned very much, very quickly. I always had to be there fighting on behalf of my members because that's what they elect me to do. It gave me an opportunity, of course, that we could make difference in the workplace. We did many differences. We changed a lot of things we did. But we also have to recognize the way our unions have, were born, the way we function can continue. The world has changed. By the way, if you go back not so long ago, this device didn't exist. It exists today. Every one of us got one, by the way. If we didn't have one, we'd go mad. And we think that if we turn it off, something will happen. <laughs> Trust me, nothing will happen. But this device also can be used in a better way. How do we communicate with the members? How do we stay in touch? How can we trust them so we can talk to them or be in touch with them? And we gotta find a way how we use technologies to our advantage to build our organization. We don't do enough of it, we can learn more. We also have to learn the way we do things that has to change. It's not the same way anymore. Because what worked 20 and 40 and 50 years ago may made a lot of sense back then. Somebody said, if you were to start over with the CLC, how would you do it? I know it's not the way we're doing it now. We're trying to evolve it to make it a better organization. But we know we can't stand still. And that's the important part of how you build a union. When I got involved, I got involved because mostly it was around human rights issue. I didn't think my union was doing enough. And I was a hell of a shit disturber. And I know it created a lot of tension in the organization. But you know what? My union became a better union as a result of it. It's a much better organization because... Human rights issue back then was, of course, you said what you felt and you did what you felt, sexism, racism, homophobia. It's all rampant. And why shouldn't it be? Our members didn't walk in and join the union and all of a sudden became good people. They came with all the crap they had in their head and then they became a union member. I used to tell employers quite often at the bargaining table, I said, you know, you always complain about the members. By God, just imagine if we get to pick them. Because, I'm mean, oh, sorry, no, no, you don't fit. You can't go, you can't. The employers pick our members just because you get the job. And then we got to struggle how we make our members into trade unionists, how we give them social values. How, what does solidarity mean? Think if you spend your entire life never been in a union. Hey, brother. What is, what is he talking about? Brother, he's talking to me. <laughs> because it's a new concept. Hey, sister. These are all new things, but I think it's critical for us to realize in the context of building our union, we have to evolve and change. And I think that's the reality of what the modern unions need to look like. Much of it is happening around the world, but the reality is we need to learn from each other. I said earlier here today on the podium, we live in a globalized world, by the way. Min in information is instantaneous. And we need to figure out how we can benefit from that. The one thing we can learn from our, from our Greek colleagues Austerity is a devastating thing. The Greek people didn't do anything wrong. The reality is the attacks that has been waged against the Greek working class have been simply unacceptable because the corporate bankers and their friends are now realized they can, Greek is just for the spoils. Who's got the most money to go and buy it and ship it? Workers didn't create the mess there. It's the rich who didn't pay their goddamn taxes to create the mess in that country. And they need to be held accountable for it. That's the reality. <laughs> so as you debate here, what you need to remind yourself, each one of us got a role to play. I see my role as the president of Congress. Every day I go out is to inspire and engage your members. 
for the things we have to do to build our organization to make it strong. After 30, well, three decades, our members still ship still 30%. It's the only country in the world where density has remained stained. But that's not good enough. I intend to turn my, my time and my mind the next little while as to how we increase that density. And there's gonna be some tough conversations because we need to have it. If we don't grow our movement, we're dying. The reality is we can't allow density to drift. If it drifts, we become irrelevant. We have no influence in society. And politics do matter. Just imagine that an employer or the government could, with the stroke of a pen can take away your rights. Are we supposed to accept that? We've got a constantly involved political world that we live in. You know, there's used an old saying, you can't separate the ballot box from the bread box. And it's a true thing because government have enormous power and so does employers, by the way. We need to take our place because engaging and mobilizing our membership for change and to fight especially at election time, to ensure those who want to destroy us know that we are going to make them feel some pain. Stephen Harper learned one thing, <coughs> that you went too far. They didn't have to, but they couldn't help themselves because they understood one thing, by the way. Every group they went after, they won, but the only group they could not defeat, despite their best effort. They could not defeat us because we were determined. And I said to our leadership, if we lose this, it was going to be, the future of the country was going to be different. The future of families was going to be different. And our movement would be in peril. We would become like our American friends. Now we won this fight. we got to take advantage of the moment. I want to conclude to say to the brothers and sisters who were at strike at BCCA in Burnaby, I want to su salute your courage and your conviction. I know how difficult this is to be on the picket line for 150 days. It's not easy. You feel isolated, but sometimes, you know what you got, the employers got to understand, we will be there one day longer because you will not beat us into submission. I want to salute you. If I could be of any help, I'd be more than happy to come and walk on your picket line and be with you and to show you my solidarity because what you're fighting for is about justice and about fairness. The employer need to come to their sense and get back to the table and negotiate a fair collective agreement. Thank you, my friends. Uh, thank you. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be your friend. You know, always I get referred to as the president of the Congress. I'm not the president of the Congress. I'm your president. And thank you for inviting me. I'm always a delight to come to your organization. I always feel I'm part of your family. It's a pleasure to be here. I wish you a successful convention, and more importantly, leave here determined, and more importantly, go out there and do what you do best, kick some ass and make the world a better place. Thank you. <laughs>